On 9-11, our city and our world changed forever. The loss, almost unimaginable. The reaction, swift, as troops were deployed to hunt down the evildoers in both Afghanistan and Iraq. We all have stories of that horrific day and the years that followed. But few people have experienced loss like my next guest. Meet Army Staff Sergeant Travis Mills. My job was the military. I loved it, you know, working with soldiers every day, doing my job was, was like the greatest for me. Coming home to my wife and kid was the best, you know, and I had a really good life mapped out. I was really doing well. People call me a hero, but I'm not sure what part of it makes me a hero. I just had a normal day at work that turned ugly. About six seconds, I guess, later, and I woke up. My medic came running up at me. I need more people over here to put on tourniquets! And about 20 seconds, he had tourniquets on both legs and both arms. I guess the last thing I said, my baby girl, am I ever going to see her again? You know, that was out. <laughs> I'm getting teared up a little, sorry. But I was really worried about what, uh, what life was going to be like afterwards, you know, like with all this. Do you love your daddy? Told him I'm getting out of here in 10 months. Kept saying, why? You know, what's your big rush? I said, hey, doc, look behind you. I had pictures of me and my wife and my daughter. I have a family. Like, I, I live in a hospital bed. Get me out of here. And joining me now is Army Staff Sergeant Travis Mills, author of this book, Tough As They Come. Staff Sergeant Mills fought through three tours of service defending our freedom. The last was voluntary on his part. It was during that tour that he was wounded. He came home a hero and a quadruple amputee, and he joins us today to talk with us. It's our pleasure to have you, Travis. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me, absolutely. We saw a little bit about what happened there. And, absolutely. and to, to give folks a, an, an understanding of this, because I want to talk about much more, what you've been doing with your life since, but you're, you're a member of the legendary 82nd Airborne Division. The best. You're, you're back for a third tour of duty, yeah. and you had said to your wife this, you felt like you had to go back this time. Why did you feel like you had to go back? Well, I mean, I had the opportunity to go. Uh, I had orders taking me somewhere else to Texas and uh, to build a brigade up. They wanted combat NCOs, but I just I didn't feel right about it. I had guys that I trained with, guys that uh, came out of high school and are fresh to the Army and look up to me, and I've taught them how to do everything. And my wife understood that it was a calling and it's a brotherhood and you don't turn your back on them. And when it came down to it, I just went to my sergeant major and I said, Sergeant Major, I don't think I can accept these orders and I said, is there anything I can do about this? Because this third deployment coming up for me and I've been with 4th Brigade combat team the whole time and I just have to go. And uh, he said he'll look into it, take care of it, and he did. And um, it's, just, it's just part of the job. You know, you don't leave your brothers in arms by themselves. If, if you haven't served, I, I think sometimes it's difficult for people to appreciate that. But people who have served, to them, it's, it's the most natural thing to do. It's, it's, it's a family that's very different from others. Is that, is that a fair way to characterize it? I think so. It? I think it's, uh, it's kind of like having a, being on a sports team. You know, you have your friends and you play sports with and you're real tight with them and you practice with them every day. But in the Army, it's different because you live with them, you eat with them, and um, you do everything you have to. But where in the sports team, you practice plays, and if you win or lose, it's okay. In the Army or any military service, you practice uh, taking down threats, and if you don't, somebody might walk. Um, somebody might uh, not walk away. So, it's uh, it's a little bit different. But you know, I didn't feel obligated to go. I wanted to go. It was voluntary to join the military. And when this third deployment came up, and I had guys looking up to me, and I was their boss, and I just couldn't see myself going anywhere else but overseas. And my wife knew that. We had a baby due. Um, she understood. She understood. Yeah. It's a special special type of spouse, I think. Absolutely. My wife's the best. You're lucky. I'm not just she's saying lucky. I'm not just saying because she's watching. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'll tell you, wife, you said that to me even before you were on the air. Um, you, you you talk a little bit in the film that we saw about how it happened, and just essentially, you're in an area, IEDs. Everybody thought it had been cleared. You simply just drop your backpack, and all of a sudden, this yep. thing goes. 
goes off. You're on the ground. Did you know the extent of your injuries initially? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so on April 10th of 2012, I was walking along, ground patrol. Everything's normal. Uh, we had a minesweeper in front, Brandon, and he was going up and down the mound uh, to check if there's anything in there. Nothing pinged, nothing made a sound, nothing acted different. So I said, okay, cool. Had my team leader come up, told him to get the gun up here. And I took my bag off, and my bag's about, you know, between 80 to 110, you know, pounds, depending on what we had in it. And we put them on the ground because we link all the rounds together. So instead of having our big gun cruiser, uh, cruiser weapon with 300 rounds, we had it linked up with about 2,000 at any given time when we came to a halt. And I set my bag down, and within a second, you know, an instant, um, uh, a bomb went off, ripped off my right arm, right leg immediately. I did a, you know, real hard slam to the ground. My left eye swelled shut. Um, my left leg was cut pieces of tendon and muscle holding on, holding it on, but nothing crazy. And my left hand was still there, but it was um, the wrist was blown out pretty good, and my ring and pinky finger were gone. So I just reached up, hit my mic, and I said, "Hey, LT, I think I hit a bomb. Uh, we're gonna need your medic over here." And his medic came over. I had a medic already with my element, so. My medic was working on me. I told him to get away from me, save my guys, because my first thought was on my soldiers. And he Did said, you think, yeah. It, and again, it's, it, it doesn't surprise me, knowing you what I've learned about you, that your first thought was for your guys, mm -hmm. your, your soldiers. Did you think at that time that you were going to survive? No, no. I've, I've seen wounds a lot, a lot less severe. Or else, to me, they were a lot less severe than what I had, and those guys didn't make it. So I didn't want to go out, you know, scared or crying. I told my, my medic, get away from me. It's cool. Don't worry about it. Like, I get what's gonna happen right now, but just tell my family I love them and uh, save my guys. And he told me, you know, let me do my job. And I kept telling him, seriously, go. Um, you know, and then and then he worked on me and the other man came running up and they worked on me. And within 10 minutes, they had me, you know, getting ready to go get on the helicopter. While I was on the helicopter, there was two other guys that got hurt with me. And uh, I was trying to yell at the flight crew. And I was like, hey, hey, take your helmet off. And they won't listen. And then I finally yelled, because I can't hear. They weren't, they weren't ignoring me, they can't hear. And I finally got them to take their helmet off. I said, give my guys water and tell them we're fine. One of my guys was yelling out in a lot of pain, which he had every right. He had pretty big holes in his legs. And, um, you know, they couldn't believe that. They wrote a nice thing. It's in, it's in the book. Uh, and tough as they come, it has a nice thing that they wrote to my wife like they couldn't believe in my situation. I made it to the ambulance, to the operating table. On the operating table, I kept trying to sit up, tell them to quit touching me. I'm fine. Leave me alone. I got to get back to my guys. They, uh, they said, I cannot believe you're still coherent and, and everything started to move. You need to go to sleep now. And the last thing I said was, my baby girl, I'm ever going to see her again. And um, at the time, I had a four-month-old, I guess, when I deployed, and six-month-old, and I got hit. And she was on, you know, once I realized the situation that I was going into the operation, my guys were taken care of. Then it was time to start thinking about other things, like my family, my wife, my kid. We should, we should mention, you showed me a yeah. wonderful picture. That little baby girl just turned four. Just yes. turned four. And uh, she's my best friend, you know, and, and we, we hang out. But uh, yeah, so they medically sedated me on the operating table, and, and uh, two days later, they cut my left hand off the rest of the way because it's getting necrotized. I kind of backtracked. When I pulled my pants off to operate on me, my left leg came with the pants. So that was easy, you know, didn't have to cut that off. And uh, I can joke around about it now because it just is I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. You know, when I got to the hospital in uh, Bethesda at Walter Reed, with great care, awesome place. On the 17th of April, I told, you know, my wife had to, like, tell him to cut some more of my leg off. Like, it was okay to get signed papers. She did. I came out of surgery. I got to talk to her, like, the 18th or 19th, and I just told her flat out. I said, you didn't sign up for this. Take everything that, that we have. You know, it's yours. Take anything in the account that we have. You know, we had a lot of money, but whatever. And, and I'm not going to hold any grudge. Like, you don't got to do this. And, and, and what did she say to you? No. She, she said, don't be silly. I said, no, seriously, I can't open anything. I can't, like, jars. I can't pick anything heavy up. And she just told me, you know, uh, that, that's not what I got married for, to leave you at a time like this, so I'm going to be here for you. And then it was, time, it was just time to make the decision. You know, it was either have someone spoon feed me or be a, you know, father figure to my daughter, who's my best friend, and teach her how to do everything. I mean, I got to learn how to walk with my daughter. Not all the parents can say they learn how to walk with, with their, their kid. With their daughter. I know you were always active when you were younger. You were, you were an athlete, a yep. football player in high school, junior college. Um, is, is part of this... And all these physical activities, not just for you, but but to show others also? I think it's very important to let people know with my situation, I'm not, you know, living life on the sidelines. You know, I'm out there being active, doing whatever I can do. And that's the reason the foundation is around, because I bring out guys in my situation and girls in my situation and show them, like, look, you can adaptively do things. I think it was the most um, rewarding trip I've ever done. I went to Breckenridge, Colorado. And I learned how to snowmo uh, snowboard, 
and learn how to mono ski. I don't really care for mono skiing that much. I can't do it as independently. But snowboarding, I mean, I learned how to snowboard on my short legs five months after my explosion, and I just never, you know, never looked back. I was just like, okay, this is, this can be done. You've got a, a great program that you're putting yeah. together up in Maine. What is the program doing for others? Really, we didn't know what we were going to do. We just wanted to give back. My wife and I wanted to help people out. We were thought about sending care packages overseas. You know, if anybody's out there going to send a care package, peanut butter M&Ms, pepper beef jerky, Orbit gum, and gummy bears. That's all you need to know. No, that's all they want. That's all I wanted anyway. <laughs> but, um, you know, something real simple, maybe three to $5,000, hopefully a year we could raise or give back because of all the love and support we were shown. But really, we had a conversation with a gentleman about all the things I was doing, how great it was. And I moved, knew uh, my wife wanted to move to Maine, so we were going to move to Maine. And we thought, let's just host a camp. Let's see how this goes. So we did two proof of concepts. That went phenomenal. We brought up guys in my situation and their families and um, showed them how to kayak, canoe, boat, fish, swim, uh, you know, to, I mean, literally anything and everything you can imagine. And so this past year we purchased a property, the Elizabeth Arden Estate. Um, she built that in 1929. She was like, uh, was a pioneer of cosmetics and Red Door Spas and things. And now we're under a massive, massive reconstruction. Uh, we're looking to raise $2.7 million. And all the, you know, all the updates are online. We keep people really informed. Everybody can go to travismills.org and keep in touch with that. And uh, it truly is something that we believe in. We've had such great success with the five or the four than the six families the last two years. And um, we want to bring people up and show them that, you know, they can do things and build a network. I mean, honestly, New York City has a lot of people. And I haven't seen one other amputee since I've been walking around here the last 12 hours. Oh. And uh, I'm trying to build that network so that people in my situation know they're not alone. That's okay to feel comfortable in your own skin. And when people stare at you, just say hello and uh, open up. But... If they have any questions, I like to have them, you know, call me, email me, talk to me about anything they're going through. I was fortunate to be um, a peer mentor at Walter Reed. It started out first. I was like, hey, Travis, can you go talk to this guy up in this room? I can't tell you his name or what room he's in, but he's not in 48 and he's not in 50, but he might be somewhere in between there. <laughs> and uh, then I went to, okay, Travis, we have Joe upstairs. His mom, dad, sister, and brother are here, and um, he's in room, you know, 830 or whatever, and and they're expecting you around 2 o'clock if you can make it. I told them you could. All right, cool. Right, I got so it. eventually they started referring to you as the mayor. They did, yeah. Because I would, uh, the building we lived in, in Building 62, I would actually strap Chloe in with a seat belt. You know, and we'd go, and she knew the sign language for grapes because uh, she couldn't talk yet. Mm -hmm. So we'd go to the cafeteria. We'd get a little bowl of grapes, probably like three or four. And we'd drive around and stop in people's rooms and ask how everything's going, see if they have any questions. Because I was higher ranking than most of the guys that get hit. Um, Good, bad, or indifferent, just how it worked out. So if they had any issues and they couldn't talk to the command, I would go do it for them. Be the guy. Yeah. Well, one of the things we've learned, I think, over the years is that the real heroes never think of themselves as heroes. And I know you've said that. Oh, yeah. Uh, that you're not a hero, but I'm going to tell you something to us and a lot of other people, you are. And I appreciate I, I that. Wanna thank you. Thank you for spending some time. Thank you for the good work you're doing for other folks. Well, well, Travis, it's a, a pleasure meeting you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, with the author's note in the book, um, I told them they had to write it specifically as I wanted it. And the big thing I tell people, I didn't sign up and do any more than anybody else. I raised my right hand like everybody else. I just had a rough day at work. So anybody that served, thank you for your service. Yep. And I tell people that um, my problems are no more than anybody else's. You don't have to be traumatically injured or be anything with the military to read this book and get something out of it. So no matter what you're going through, I don't think I'm any more special. Well, I just have the platform to talk about, and I appreciate if it. nothing else, I'm going to tell your Chloe that she has a special dad. Oh, thank you. Thanks, man. That's a appreciate pleasure. it. You'd be well. Absolutely. Again, the book is called Tough As They Come, written, as we said, by a true American hero, Army Staff Sergeant Travis Mills. And we're delighted that he spent some time with us.